morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you here this morning to our time of worship at Kernville Baptist Church. We are excited that you're here this morning. If this is your first time visiting with us this morning and the seat in front of you, you'll find a white card. That is our Connect card. Take a moment to fill one of those out. That gives us a record of your visit, and that also gives me the opportunity to reach out to you over the course of the next uh, next week or so. Usually I try to respond to those on Monday or Tuesday, so if you fill one of those out, I'll hopefully get to you uh, pretty quick on that. We've got a few announcements this morning, the first of which is that following the service this morning, we have a congregational meeting, so that'll be about 10 to 15 minutes after the service is over. Uh, anybody is welcome to stay for that. Uh, 
church members are, are, are the only ones that are allowed to vote on the matters that we will discuss there, but that will be happening after the service. Next week, we have a church council meeting after the service up in the library. Um, and this week, we have uh, one of our own, Jason Bachman, and his daughter, Charlotte, are going to be traveling up to Camp of the Woods in Canada. If you guys recall, last summer, that's where we went for our mission trip, and we went up there, and we helped them get the camp set up, and then when we came back, we realized they had a, a pretty big need, and that was that their sound system had, it had aged out, and uh, it was time to replace that. So you guys all contributed during the, during the, around Christmas time to a project we called Project Amplify, which was to get a new sound system together for them, and so this week, Jason and Charlotte are going to go up there and they're going to install the thing and get it ready for them to be able to use for all of their summer missions and then uh, then they're going to help out in whatever ways they're needed which I 100% will guarantee be carrying firewood for about three or four straight days so um, it's gonna be it's gonna be fun for them but pray for their safety they're flying up to Winnipeg and then driving over to Camp of the Woods in Northwest Ontario so um, you know Probably the main danger is just hitting a moose. So other than that, I think they're probably going to be okay. So um, pray for their safety this week. Uh, we, we have in the bulletin here again the same request for last week. As we are trying to get our church directory um, up to date, we are still missing the pictures of quite a few people. So if at, if at any point you did not give us a picture, email one of those to info at kernvillechurch.com, and then Dorothy can place that in the bulletin and, or place that in the directory. And then that way, as people are trying to get to know everyone, that they'll be able to see faces and put faces to names there. Um, I put in the bulletin here um, that... You guys know that we support missionaries in Haiti. We've gone to Haiti twice, 2017 and 2018. We've been telling you for a while that things have gotten bad there. We collected money and sent computers to the workers because the workers are having a hard time getting from place to place, so they need to be able to work from home. So we sent five laptop computers to Haiti this uh, during the spring, and uh, things have just gone from bad to worse. I think a lot of you may have seen it on the news. There was a young couple out of Missouri, 23 and, uh, 22 and 23 years old, who were killed on the mission field along with, their, uh, with the, the missionary that, that, that was with them there. And so things have gotten really dangerous. So I just want to encourage you to pray for Jackie and Edna and Vasa and all of the people that, uh, that we've connected with. You guys recall back in 2019, Jackie and Edna came here and they presented their ministry and were able to connect and, and get resources and things like that. But be praying for them because it's a hard place to be. It's a difficult uh, field and the, the things are just, they seem to just be getting worse day to day. So be praying for that family um, that lost their lives and be praying for our missionaries there as well. Uh, a couple other things that are on the horizon. First is family camp. If you guys, in your bulletin, you have one of three color inserts here related to family camp. If you have not yet signed up for that, that is going to be the 20, or, uh, 21st through 24th of June. That's a really fun time. We go up to Camp Yenisante, which is right up on Greenhorn here. So even though we're not really far from town, it feels like a whole different world up there. So um, we, we would love for you to join us. All the details are on here. And then the sign-up sheet is right back here on the left-hand side. You know, my brother-in-law commented that, uh, you know, he'd heard our services, and I'm always saying, you know, directly beneath the light, but there's no lights on there. So directly beneath where the light is, but not on, is the, uh, is the sign-up for that. Um, so sign up. We, we have... Uh, we have lots of spaces available there. It's a really fun family. Oh, there they go. Lights on. <laughs> and then the, the last thing is related to Vacation Bible School. Vacation Bible School this, uh, this year is going to be July 4th through 6th, and we're going to be doing it off-site over at South Fork Middle School. Uh, it's going to be a really fun time, but we, we need a lot of workers. So um, there's a sign-up sheet. It's the blue one on the other side over here. If you are able to help or you would like to help, we need help with setup. We need help with taking kids around. We need help with various ministry areas there. So if you are able to do that, uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Go ahead and sign up for that this morning, and that way Lacey can start putting her plan together for who's going to be where and what they're going to be doing. Uh, the last thing this morning is uh, Aaron has... He didn't. Has a presentation to make. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned once a couple weeks ago, we started a scholarship fund for the youth in our church. 
And we were blessed to have a lot of people donate it. The scholarship fund is still open. It continues year-round. So anytime you feel led, feel led, you can donate to that because we want to keep this going year after year. But we did, the committee met and selected a scholarship recipient. So Michaela Ritchie. <laughs> Come on down. Surprise, I forgot to tell you. On behalf of our church, we would like to present you with a $400 scholarship to further your education. Thank you, Erin. She was surprised because she already received that, um, not the actual scholarship, but she received the notice that she got the scholarship back at, at the awards night. So she's surprised. Um, <laughs> And just as for clarification, I've had a lot of people go, ooh, she got into Stanford. Samford. It's a different <laughs> thing. It's still, it's a really great school, but it's not in, outside of San Francisco. It's in Birmingham, Alabama. So um, go ahead, take a moment, stand, greet everybody this morning, and let them know you're glad to see them, and then we'll continue on in worship. I'm calling on the God of Jacob. Whose love endures new generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the ocean I'm standing 
blowing on the Holy Spirit. Almighty River, come and fill me again. So God, we come to you this morning. We acknowledge our need of you in the big and the small ways. Um, and we just pray that your presence would be here with us through your Holy Spirit, that you would fill us, that you would fill and guide Ben as he comes to share the word, that you would help us to, to hear and understand what you would speak to us, and that your, uh, your word and your spirit would change our hearts and change our lives as we hear from you. We just ask for your blessing upon this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 2. If you do not have a Bible in the seat in front of you underneath, there are some pew Bibles down there, and we are in Mark chapter 2. So I want to begin by taking note of something that I think is a little bit crazy, and that is running a marathon. Okay, marathon, marathon runners are an enigma to me. It's, it's 26 miles that gets, it's a race of 26 miles that gets its name from the legend of Pheidippides. And if you know anything about this story, he is a man who was said to have been at the Battle of Marathon against the Persians. And when the battle was turning in the favor of the Greeks, <clears throat> and it was apparent they were going to win, the Persians pulled their ships and started going a different direction. Pheidippides and those around him determined that they were going to be taking their ships around the Horn and over to Athens in order to go claim a false victory. And so Pheidippides decided that he was going to run all the way back to Athens. Athens from Marathon, which is a distance of 26 miles. And if you know the story, you know that Pheidippides took off running and eventually threw off his armor and threw off his weapons and then threw off his clothes. And then the guy ran 26 miles naked, burst into the assembly, declared that they had won the victory, and then promptly dropped dead on the floor from exhaustion. So, so that we're clear about what the first marathon was, it was a panicked naked man running across the country, bursting into the door and promptly dropping dead on the floor. I do not know how at some point somebody thought that would be a good idea to start doing as like a fitness challenge, but that's what a marathon is. Now, it doesn't sound like a really good idea to me, but with that said, to run a marathon is a pretty incredible feat because it takes dedication, and it takes resolve, and it takes patience. You have to train for it. You have to work for it. And when all is said and done, I really do respect those who do the work in order to be able to go run a marathon, because at some point, they have to get complete control over their body and their will and say, we are going to keep doing this. Guys, I get about a quarter of a mile, and I'm like, all right, I'm done. Okay, I'm done. I'm, I'm throwing off the weapons. I'm keeping my clothes on here, but the weapons are gone. I'm done. I can't run anymore at this point. But I, I respect that kind of resolve. Now this morning, as we continue on in our series on the miracles of Jesus, we're going to a story of resolve and a story of faith. A story where there are four men who refuse to let the barriers and the obstacles stop them from getting to Jesus. So if you've got your Bibles in Mark chapter 2, follow along with me. We're going to read the first two verses, and then we're going to take the rest of the passage as we move. It says, And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And then you have a group that comes, and they bring a paralytic carried by four men. So when we set the stage of what's going on here, this is back at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus, his base of operations was in a town called Capernaum. Capernaum was at the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus had been out preaching and healing and been moving his way through Galilee. And he finally came back to home base. And when he came back, the word spread about him being there. And so everyone just started coming out of the woodwork. They were like paparazzi, right? Like they're just creeping around, getting in the, in the house. They're all over the place. The house fills up, and it tells us that there were so many people that had gathered there that no one was getting in. Now, to, to understand like the full 
full idea here, we need to consider what Capernaum was like in the first century. A few weeks ago, my friend Matt was in Capernaum, and he took these photographs. And, and if you see the way that everything is all tightly in there, this was a city where houses shared walls, were moving from place to place, were just narrow pathways. The houses in Capernaum were oftentimes small. There's a picture in the next slide here. This is the one on the right. That's looking down into one of those houses in Capernaum. And then in the next slide, I'll show you kind of what, the, what they would have looked like. Everything was all tied together. They had flat roofs and things like this. So if you look at a picture like this and you imagine the whole city is all interconnected like that, you get the idea of why it would have been so difficult for anybody to get in. You know, we're so used to kind of our Western ideas of having yards and all this other kind of stuff. It was like this. And so all the people, when Jesus came back, they all crowded in and they crowded around so that nobody could get inside that house. And it's into this setting that you have this group of men. There are four men who are carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher, and they are trying to get into the house, and they realize that there is no way for them to get there. But they decided that come hell or high water, we are getting into that house and we are getting our friend to Jesus. Continue reading with me, verses 3 through 5. It says, And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are are forgiven. So this morning, we're going to examine in this passage the power of faith and and resolve and the motives behind why Jesus did what he did, because within this story, there are truths that we can glean about our own interaction with Christ in our own journey of faith. And so we're going to make three general observations this morning. And the first is this, that this is a story of faith and forgiveness. The miracle that happens here, and we haven't read down to the very end of this, the miracle that happens here presents some interesting details about the nature and the reach of faith. But something, as we're just reading in it, they bring a man, they lower the man down, Jesus looks at the guys who are lowering him down, and then he says to this man, your sins are forgiven. And that presents a little bit of a conundrum for us because We don't really see the man exercising any faith. We see somebody else exercising faith. And then yet Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. So before we dive in, I want to clarify something that could get really murky if I don't. And it is that we are all responsible for exercising faith in relationship to Jesus, right? It is a personal thing that we exercise our faith. There is a doctrine out there, and it's it's one of the core doctrines of the Baptist faith called soul competency. And the idea of soul competency is that each of us have the opportunity and the obligation to exercise personal faith, and we are all competent to do so if we desire salvation. So what what I mean by that is my mom can't have faith, and then me get saved from that, right? My wife can't have faith, and then my sins be forgiven by virtue of her faith. We are all individually responsible to come to Christ. And if we don't say that right at the beginning, it would be easy for us to look at what happens here and go, ah, but here's a clear example of somebody who did not necessarily exercise faith, and yet, yet they received from Jesus. I want to suggest this morning that, that their faith blesses this man, but it is not necessarily the key to salvation for this man. So, first of all, a story of faith and forgiveness. And so we need to examine the relationship of resolve and faith. Now, a few weeks ago, I said in in Hebrews 11.1 that faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now, in this setting, for this story that we're reading today, it is a belief and a conviction that Jesus can and will do something that leads these men to undertake certain actions. They're hindered from getting to Jesus, but they refuse to be deterred. Right? We say if there's a will, there's a way, and this is what's going on with these men. Getting into the house by the ordinary means was not going to happen. Right? They couldn't get into the door. Take the picture of the house again here. There's no, there's no getting into the door because there's people blocking everywhere. And you can't just shove the guy like mail through the mail slot through the window and drop him on his head so he's not going through the window. So these guys, they realized that the best possible way to get to Jesus is to go up. 
Now, houses in Capernaum, a lot of the, the first century Middle Eastern houses, they had a staircase that would go up alongside of the house because when you're in this claustrophobic city where everything is close together and you need to get out and away from it, you go up and you go onto the roof. So you'll see that right up here you have this stuff up on the roof and that's where people would go. And what they realized is that if closeness, they had the faith that if closeness and proximity to Jesus meant that we might be able to receive a healing for our friend, the closest, the best way to get close to Jesus is go up, go over, and then begin to tear the roof apart. Because the roof itself, it had timbers and it had beams and it would have had thatch. And then a lot of times it would have either mud over the top of it or it would have tiles. And so they're like, we can't get anywhere close to Jesus around the house, but if we can get above Jesus, well, we're just a few feet away from him. And if we can cut a hole here, we can lower our friend down and get him into that house. What we see is four men who believed enough in the power of Jesus to take unreasonable and unusual action. And that is a demonstration of their faith. This is what James 2.18 tells us. It says that faith is evidenced by what? By works. And the fact that these men were, were so desperate to get to Jesus, they would undertake anything, including, by the way, vandalizing somebody's house and cutting a hole in their roof. It demonstrates their faith. Second of all, we consider the relationship of faith and blessing. So when, it, when these guys lower their friend down, it says when they got here, they cut the hole, they made the opening in the roof, and they lowered down the bed on which the paralytic lay. It doesn't tell us how they lowered him down, whether it was corner to corner. We don't know how big the hole was, whether it was small enough to just shove him down through there and they had him tied up, or if they cut a giant hole and lowered him down. The fact of the matter is, by the way, if you think about this scene, it's pretty humorous because Jesus is in here teaching, and then some guys start chopping a hole in the ceiling. How long does he continue teaching before he stops and all attention goes to these guys? How long until the owner of the house runs up there and tries to stop them? Cuts a hole in the roof, lowers it down, and what it tells us is that when Jesus saw this, it says when he saw their faith, he declares, your sins are forgiven. And that's unexpected, right? Because why did these guys come to Jesus? What did, what did they want? They want healing, Right? They weren't just bringing their paralytic friend because they were like, man, you're a really bad guy and we need your sins forgiven, so we got to get you to Jesus. They're like, your arms and legs don't work, so let's get you to Jesus and see if he can remedy that. But what he says is your sins are forgiven. There's one other place in the Gospels in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus makes a similar statement. There's a woman that's there and she is crying and she's anointing Jesus' feet and Jesus says to her, woman, your sins are forgiven. In that instance, it's very clear that she's contrite. It's very clear that there is a repentance going on with this woman, but we don't really know anything about the paralytic's faith, do we? Because it really doesn't tell us anything. What it tells us is it tells us about the friend's faith. Look at the pronouns in this passage. It says, and when he was preaching the word, they came bringing to him a paralytic. And when they could not get near to the crowd, they removed the roof. They made an opening. And when Jesus saw their faith, then he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, it's, it's their faith that elicits a response from Jesus. And again, this, this creates a little bit of a conundrum for us because, again, we do believe the idea of soul competency, that every one of us is responsible to Jesus if we want to receive salvation or we want to receive forgiveness. And so there are several ways that this has been handled. Some have pointed out the fact that you know, the, the word there does not necessarily exclude the paralytic because, after all, like maybe he's the one who said, hey, get me to Jesus. Maybe he's the one who said, if you guys can just get me to Jesus, that will, that will heal all of my problems. So it might be that it's his faith along with theirs. There are others who, who suggest that possibly this guy's ailment and malady was not actually just a physical thing, but that there was something spiritual going on. But what we see is that Jesus prioritizes the healing of sin before he prioritizes the healing of the body. And this teaches us something important because the reality is, is that if you have a perfect body that is working 100% and yet your sins are never forgiven, what happens to you? You're going to die and be in an eternal separation from Jesus. 
And what every one of us needs, the deepest healing that every one of us needs, is we need to be healed of the sins that so easily beset us. We need to be healed of the sin nature that drives the things that we do. And so Jesus, before he ever gets to healing him physically, prioritizes that, that most important restoration, which is the restoration of the soul, not the restoration of the body. In either case, whether or not it was he exercised faith here or if this was something related to a sin issue that was going on in his body, we see that Jesus starts with forgiveness. And what that does is it opens the door for a confrontation that's going to happen that allows him to teach a deeper truth about the connection between the healing of the body and the healing of the soul. So we see that the faith of these men comes and it's a blessing to this man who had no way to get to Jesus. And this isn't, by the, by the way, the main point of this passage, but I think there's an important application we can make as we just consider the fact that you've got this group of men who carry their friend to Jesus because he has a desperate need, and they don't fully understand the desperate need, right? They look at it and they're like, the desperate need is the arms and legs don't work, so we need to get him there. But what they're going to learn from this is that the more desperate need is that this is a sinner who needs forgiveness. And so they bring him to Jesus, Now, did he want to go? Probably yes. But it's the tenacity and the resolve of these friends that pull apart the roof and carry him up top and lower him down and take care of all of these different things because he was surrounded by people who would advocate for him and bring him to Jesus. And I want to say sort of as a a minor application of this, this is what we desperately need when it comes to the people who are around us. We need to be surrounded by people who will do whatever it takes to get us to Jesus. And we need to be the kind of people who will do whatever it takes to get our friends and our family and our loved ones to Jesus. Because ultimately, the the problems that are going on in our life are nothing compared to the, the problem of sin in our lives, and we need them to come to Jesus and know Jesus. Surround yourself with people who are going to pull you or push you or drag you to Jesus, whatever it takes. Because what we see going on in this passage is when these guys bring him to Jesus, he is blessed by virtue of their faith. You know, there have been times in my life where I have been blessed by God, not because of anything that I did or any faith that I had. You, know, you think about this. I grew up in a home where, where my mother constantly brought me to church, sometimes dragged me to church, right? Because like, I'm a, I was a kid. I didn't want to go. And, it, and, and anything short of me being like on my deathbed, you're going to church. I look back at that now, and I really appreciate that because she did whatever it took to get me to Jesus. And you know, there have been times in my life where I've struggled with doubt and where I've struggled with all kinds of other issues going on in my life. And I know that there was my mother and my wife and my friends and my church were all praying for me. And it was their faith that became a blessing to me. And so that's what we see, first of all, in this story, is it's a story of faith and forgiveness surrounded by people who would bring him to the Lord. Second of all, we look at verses 6 through 8, and we see that it's a story of revelation and rejection. So it says in verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there. Now this is, this is a, a, a detail that pops up a lot in the Gospels. Jesus goes out and he teaches and he preaches, and the very people who really didn't like him were constantly showing up. And the reason they were doing it is because they got to figure out what Jesus is doing. They have to know what he's up to because in their eyes, this guy's going to disrupt everything. And so it says the scribes were sitting there and it tells us what they're doing. It says, and they were questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceived in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves and then he speaks to them. So this is also a story of revelation and rejection. The scribes, they feel the same tension that we feel when we read this passage. What does forgiveness have to do with any of this? The guy is coming for healing. Why is it that Jesus is talking about forgiveness? But they go a step further than just wondering, what does forgiveness have to do with this? They're going to find out soon enough here. But their question is, who does this guy think he is? Now, I want to tell you that while the the overall flow of this passage is that it's a rebuke on those religious leaders, those scribes who doubted who Jesus was, we have to say at the beginning that they, they weren't wrong, right? 
I don't usually come to the defense of the scribes and Pharisees when I'm preaching on the Gospels. Usually they're pretty much just the bad guys, and you can kind of lump them in here and like Disney bad guys. They just, they just do bad things, and they're always rejecting. But understand something. They weren't wrong, right? Because the statement that Jesus makes here is an upsetting statement. When Jesus says to this guy, son, your sins are forgiving, what is he doing? He's absolving this man of sin. It was not kosher in the first century to go around telling people that their sins were absolved. Yes, you could forgive somebody who sinned against you, but ultimately only God alone could absolve the sins in somebody's life. And they recognized this. God alone can forgive sins. The overall date debt of sin and the weight of sin does not belong to any of us or is not on any other person. It's back on the Lord. That's why when he sacrifices himself on the cross, that it can take care of those sins because every sin is ultimately against him. So he is the one who absolves sin. Now, the priest, he could petition the Lord. He could offer a sacrifice, but ultimately he can't can't declare absolution of sin. And in the broad landscape of Christianity today, one of the biggest divides between Protestants and Catholics is around the, the idea of mediation and who mediates and who absolves sin. And within the Roman Catholic Church, you go to a priest and you go into the confessional, and then what does the priest do? The priest declares absolution. He says, go pray this prayer, go do this thing, but ultimately he declares that the sins there are forgiven. And Protestants, we hear this and and we kind of recoil at it. Why? Because we understand there is one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. We recognize that only God can actually forgive sins. And so it's an upsetting statement. Put it in in our own context for a minute to kind of feel the tension of how they would feel. I want you to imagine that you're going and you're talking to somebody and you're having one of those moments where you just kind of got to clear the soul and you start telling somebody about something bad that you did and you really regret it and you're you're feeling bad about it. And after you finish telling them what you did, they go, they smile and they say, it's okay. I've forgiven your sins. You're now clean. Okay, imagine somebody that like has nothing to do with it saying those things to you. You'd respond just like the Pharisees were. You'd be like, dude, stay in your lane. That's not your job to forgive my sins. I wasn't telling you this for your forgiveness because you're not the one who I sinned against. So we see that there's an upsetting statement that leads to a reasonable complaint. Listen to what, they, what they're thinking here. It says, why does this man speak like that? Like, why is he saying these things? He is blaspheming who can forgive sins but God alone. Now try to understand the heart of their complaint. Their complaint is you are making yourself out to be equal to like or you are making yourself out to be God by declaring something that doesn't actually belong to you. When they accuse Jesus of blasphemy, they think that they are, that they are defending God against some, assault, some insult, right? Blasphemy is defined as this. It's an insult that shows contempt, disrespect, or lack of reverence concerning a deity or an object that's considered sacred. In the Jewish system, in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 15, it tells us that someone who blasphemes against God is worthy of death. This is as bad as you can get. So when they're thinking this, they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, whoa, 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 this is as bad a a guy as as you can get. He is claiming to forgive sins. He has no right to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. That's their complaint. You know, in 1966, when the Beatles had kind of apexed and they were, they, were, they were getting up here and getting popular, John Lennon made a statement. You guys know the statement John Lennon made? He was asked about their popularity and he said that we are more popular than Jesus. And in England, nobody really responded to that. They were like, oh, okay, that's probably fair. The churches were already dying at that point. Everyone was listening to the Beatles. But in the United States, that did not go over well. And they started canceling their songs on the radio and people were burning their albums and there was this outcry and people were really upset about what they said. Why? Because they considered it to be disrespectful. They considered it to be blasphemous. Well, the scribes, that's exactly how they felt when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. The complaint was that Jesus, who in their eyes was just a man, was claiming things that only God could do. And if he's not God, that's a reasonable complaint. But the problem is, Mark is going to cue us in here to the fact that Jesus is something more than meets the eye, because it says, and immediately in verse 8, 
Jesus perceived in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, and then he asked them, why do you question these things in your hearts? You know, I think about that sometimes, about how off-putting that whole thing must have been. Jesus is up here speaking, and he says something, and then they, in their hearts, start formulating their defense, and then Jesus looks directly at them and says the very things that they're thinking. I can imagine that on a Sunday morning if I'm sitting here and I'm, or you guys imagine this on a Sunday morning and I'm preaching something and you're sitting back here going, well, I totally disagree with that. I don't think he really looked that up. And then I look right at you and say, I did look that up. And you're like, <laughs> what just happened here? Okay, that's what goes on here. The Pharisees, they're not wrong about this, this statement that they're thinking. Only God can forgive sins. But where they're wrong is that they rejected the idea that Jesus might have been more than meets the eye. They've rejected the idea that maybe Jesus is something different than they originally thought. See, if he was just a man, rejection made sense. But if he was more than just a man, and what he was giving them here was a glimpse into what he was really about, if what he was giving them here is a revelation, then their rejection is tragic. And that's exactly what verse 8 shows us. He's not just some ordinary person. He's not just some run-of-the-mill prophet. He's not just some teacher. He is the guy who, as soon as they start thinking the thoughts, knows the thoughts they're thinking. Who can do that? Well, Psalm 139 tells us exactly who can do that, who knows the words before they're even on our tongue, before we fully formulate the thoughts, who knows these things. Well, it's God who knows these things. And so Mark wants us to see here that this statement on forgiveness, the recoil and rejection of the Pharisees, and then the clairvoyance of Jesus to know what they're thinking is pointing us to a larger reality. Now, take a moment to, to examine this response because it's important to the story. These are guys who were teachers of the law. The scribes were the scholars. They were the pastors. They were the, the people who studied and copied. That's In fact, that's what the scribes did. They're the scribes of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are the guys who are the scholars and the lawyers. They're the ones who learn the scriptures. The scribes are the ones who write the scriptures so they know what the word says. So they're understandably cautious when some flashy new preacher rolls up on the scene and starts teaching and preaching things because they realize that there are going to be people who come to deceive. In fact, if you were living in first century Israel at this point, you've already had supposed messiahs rolling in over the course of the previous several hundred years. People who came in and everyone was like, is this person the messiah? Is this person the messiah? So Jesus comes on the scene. They're supposed to be cautious about that. You know, as a pastor, when people come in the church, new people come in the church, I'm always excited, but I'm always, I'm always cautious too. When somebody comes in the church and they're like just gung-ho to get involved and they want to teach and they want to lead and they want to be involved in all this, there's a part of me that's really excited and there's a part of me that's like, whoa, let's just, let's just slow down a little bit. Let's get to know each other here and kind of figure out what's going on because if that person has been sent by the Lord, that's amazing. We're going to have something great. God is going to fill holes in the church, plug them in, and then the church is going to be better as a result. But it's also possible that people that come in are, are not those things. What if this person comes in with nefarious motives? What if this person comes in and they, they have this, this selfish need to be validated and, infer, or, and affirmed? Or what if they come into the church and they are a Trojan horse of heretical ideas? Should we not be cautious about those things? That's exactly what goes on with the scribes of the Pharisees. The burden of leadership is caution and discernment. But if we are following after the Lord, along with that caution and that discernment, there also needs to be an openness to what if God is doing something new? What if God is doing something to confound our expectations? That's what they lacked. That's what they lacked. And what should have come after this is, okay, he's saying incredible things. He's saying things that only God can say. All right, now let's, let's watch and let's see if the actions that follow the words are in line with who it seems he's claiming to be. Let's see what the proof is. And that's where the rest of the story goes. The thing is, is that the scribes, the Pharisees, they were not unaware of the miracles of Jesus. 
In fact, I presume that the reason that these guys are here in the first place, the reason that they are there listening is because it's the beginning of his ministry. They're still trying to figure out who he is. They're trying to, still trying to figure out who, what he's about. They're still trying to figure out, are we for him or are we against him? Do we believe his message or don't we believe his message? There are going to be a few of them that right here at this moment, they're going to make up their mind. This guy is a blasphemer. This guy is claiming something that doesn't belong to him. But the people who are around, they're going to have a different response altogether. So this brings us to the point of the miracle. Let's read verses 8 through 12. It says, Jesus, he he questions or he perceives in his spirit that they question within themselves. And so he says to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, he's referring to himself there, has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So ultimately, this is a story of purpose and proof. Now, how many of you guys are familiar with Phil Swift? Anybody know who Phil Swift is? If I just say the name, you're probably like, means nothing. Show you the picture, now you know who it is. This is the infomercial guy from the Flex Tape commercials. And, and Flex Tape, the makers of this product, they made some pretty bold claims about what it could do. They said that this will stick underwater. They said you can wrap pipes with this and this will stop the leaks. They said you can take this and put it inside your swimming pool and it will stop the water from leaving the pool. Those are all pretty bold claims. And anybody who has ever used tape, guys, even like Gorilla Tape. Gorilla Tape's a great product. That's some sticky stuff. It doesn't do what the Flex Tape claims to do. So we're all right to be skeptical when somebody says, this flex tape can do all these wonderful things. And that's where Phil Swift comes in in order to demonstrate so that we can see with our own eyes what the product can do. And this is the most iconic scene from the commercials. Phil taking that piece of tape, slapping it on that two inch hole in that acrylic tank right there and stopping the water from coming out. What is he doing there? He's proving the claims. Saying this tape can stop the water boom, he slaps it on. And guys, I don't know, by the way, if this actually does this. If any of you guys have bought this, apparently the people who really love flex tape is RVers. Like that's like the main base of people who buy it because they slap that tape on everything. But the point is that he's proving the claims. You can say that the tape can do all this all day long, but the proof is in the pudding. Let's see how it works. Now, what is an issue in this text? is that Jesus is claiming to forgive sins. The problem with forgiveness is that forgiveness is invisible, right? We don't all have two set of lights on us, and if we're unforgiven, the red light's on, and if we're forgiven, the green light's on, and Jesus says, you're forgiven, red light goes off, green light goes on, people are like, oh my gosh, he's forgiven. Okay, that's not how it works. You can't see forgiveness, and so what Jesus does here is, is because you can't see it, he does something flashier and observable so that his identity as one who can forgive sins is known through what he does. And this, by the way, was the job of the Pharisees. Listen and watch. Come to your conclusions after you've seen if the words actually match the actions. And so what Jesus does here is he makes a strategic move. In recent years, my kids have gotten into chess. And uh, they, they like to play chess. And chess is a game of strategy. Every move you make in chess is to elicit a mistake from your opponent. And you're ultimately trying to get everything moved so that finally their king is trapped and there's no way out. And you can, through this game, you're constantly putting them in check and then they move their king out. And eventually you get to that point where you have them in a position that the king can't go anywhere and that's called checkmate, right? That's the end of the game. Now, many readers and commentators have looked at this passage and they've looked at Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven and they've scratched their head. This isn't about forgiveness. Why is he forgiving people? Why is he doing this? What they wanted was for this guy to be healed. Why is Jesus declaring absolution? Well, I'm convinced that the reason he's doing it is he's putting the scribes and the Pharisees in check to force them to make a move so that he can finally prove to them 
through his actions that he is the one who has the authority not only to, to heal the physical infirmities, but also to forgive sins. This is important. Why? Because ultimately the whole trajectory of Jesus in his whole ministry is going to get to the end where you start seeing that the great healing is the, the, the healing from sin. Right? That's what we're going to get to. That's the point of the cross, by the way. The point of the cross is not so that we'll be healed of our physical infirmities. You will find people from the time of Christ till now who follow after Jesus who still suffer with cancer and with paralysis and with a host of other different ailments. That's not the point. The point is not to give us a physical wholeness. Yes, in the end, all who follow after Christ, when they are resurrected and restored, will be brought to that point. So yes, we all will receive that at one point. But before you get there, you've got to get to the forgiveness of sins. And that's what Jesus does here. He makes the strategic move. And the scribal, the scribal interaction provides an opportunity for an undeniable proof. The miracle story here is about proving a point. You say that only God can forgive sins, and you're right. And I'm forgiving sins, so you fully understand what it is that I'm claiming, so that you know that what I claim is true. Let me do something that seems much harder and show you that I have the divine authority. See, we're tempted when we look at a story like this to go, well, you know, the, the healing of the paralytic, that's the harder thing, right? Because here's, here's what's going on. Like if somebody's in this sanctuary and they've got some sort of physical ailment and they come up and they say, pastor, heal me. By the way, please don't ever do that to me because I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to go, you know, I'll pray for you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to declare words of, of you know, healing. Why? Because if it doesn't happen, then you guys go, well, does he even have a connection? Is there even really? That's the point, right? If Jesus says, I declare that you are healed and then the guy isn't healed, then what do the people conclude? False prophet, right? So it's the more dire situation to declare that somebody is healed. So we look at that as the big thing. And then we look at forgiveness as the small thing because Jesus is forgiving all the time, right? How many of you have been forgiven this week by Jesus? Dozens of times this week I've been forgiven because dozens of times I've sinned and I've failed. And so we look at that as the smaller thing, but what Jesus is doing is he's flipping the script. And what he's showing them is that the, the physical healing, the miracle is just a tool to prove the point that I have the ability to forgive sins. And by the way, this is something, and I hope you've been getting it as we've been going through this series, the miracles, those are always just tools to prove something else. The miracles are always a tool to prove something. This is why in the Bible they're called signs and wonders. Why are they called signs? Because they point to something. They point to another reality. And that's exactly what the miracle that he does here is meant to do. It's to prove the point that he has authority over sins. Only God can forgive sins, but only God can fully restore a broken person. So he uses something visible to prove something invisible. I can forgive sins and I can heal the paralyzed man for the very same reason, because I'm the one who has the authority and the power to declare these things. What is he saying there? What's the underlying message? The Pharisees, they say, only God can forgive sins. Jesus says, so that you might know that I have the authority to forgive sins on earth. I say to this man, rise up, take your bed and walk. What's the statement Jesus is making? I am God. That's the statement that he's making. Make no mistake about it, right? Sometimes people look at the Gospel of John and they say, the Gospel of John is the one where the divinity of Christ is clearly demonstrated, where Jesus is claiming to be divine. You get here to Mark chapter 2, that's exactly what Jesus is claiming. If only God can forgive sins, and I'm proving to you that I have the ability to, prove sin, to, uh, to forgive sins, then I am God. He's revealing his identity. And he's placing the cards on the table so that everyone that's there is going to have to make a decision about who he is. When Jesus works, it reveals his character and his nature and his power and his ability and his authority, and it always creates a moment of choice, and it always creates a moment of tension. And the people that see him do these things and that hear these words, they have to make a choice. What do I do with this? Well, look at what the people here do. It says, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed and he went out before them so that they all were amazed and they glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. Like we've never seen 
anything like this. They're astounded. They're primed to believe because they see this man who just moments before was crippled to the point he couldn't walk, he couldn't do anything, and now he's picking up his bed and he's walking like he'd been walking his entire life. They see this. A life has changed, and hearts and minds are changing as a result of this. And so Jesus clearly makes his point. I can forgive sins and more. But the question that we have to ask is, what happens with the scribes here? What happens with these religious leaders who are thinking in their hearts? Like, only God can forgive sins. This man is blaspheming. That is, this man who is not God is offending God with the things that they're saying. Well, the rest of the story tells us, if you continue on in the book of Mark, that they harden their hearts. In fact, if you just flip over to Mark chapter 3... Flip over there. It's just one page over. In 22, it says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. So this is their response to this, is they see, they can't deny that something supernatural has happened, right? Like if you know, if you have somebody that you know is in this physical condition, like these towns, by the way, Capernaum, it's not a giant city. It's a small enough town to where people knew what was going on with other people's lives. It's like Kernville. Like I've said this in the series before. We know most of what's going on with people in this town. If you see somebody that you know has been paralyzed for years and now suddenly they're up and walking, you can't deny that. And the Pharisees, they never denied that Jesus was doing anything supernatural. What they concluded is he's doing this in the power of Satan. He's doing this in the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. So the ones, by the way, who, are, who are, are so upset because they thought Jesus was blaspheming, they commit blasphemy here because they refuse to believe. They harden their hearts. They refuse to receive the revelation. Their box for God was too small. Their boundaries were too rigid. And they lacked the humility to change their minds when they were proven wrong. Think about the two responses here. You've got these four men that they are resolved that they are going to bring their friend in. Why? Because they genuinely believed Jesus can do something for our friend. They're, they come in with this resolve and they receive the miracle and they receive the forgiveness. And then you have the Pharisees, the scribes of the Pharisees, who are resolved to remain in disbelief. That's, that's the two different poles here. And when Jesus works, we all have to make a choice on what we're going to do with it. When we see what he's done, we can choose. I choose to believe that this is one who can change my life. Or I refuse to believe that this is one who can change my life. And it's tragic that the religious leaders, the people who studied the scriptures, the people who every day were waiting for the Messiah to return, the people who were preaching and teaching to others that, that God is going to intervene in the life of his, of his people, that God has power and ability. These are the very people who absolutely reject it when God shows up in power. So for us, what do we do with this passage? What are the takeaways from this? I want to offer you this morning three takeaways as we close. The first is that what we learn about Jesus in this passage is that he is all about restoration. The restoration of the physical, the restoration of the spiritual, Jesus is about restoration. He's able and willing to not only heal, but also to forgive. And what we see in this story is that the chief healing that he gives is the forgiveness of sins. So whether it's the infirmities that we have going on in our life, maybe he chooses to forgive those, maybe he doesn't. But what he promises is that if we will come in faith, he will always forgive the sin, right? If we confess our sins, say it with me, if we confess our sins, he's what? He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, there is not a promise in the scripture that every single physical infirmity that you have is going to be healed, but there is a promise that if we come to him in faith, he will forgive the sins. Jesus is about restoration. Second of all, we see the power of faith and resolve. Jesus responded to the tenacity of these friends in their their willingness to grab hold of the possibility and not let go of the possibility that Jesus might heal. And as a result, their friend is blessed. It's a lot like Jacob in Genesis 32, 26, where he grabs on to God and he wrestles. You've heard the story of Jesus, of, of Jacob wrestling with this angel of the Lord and he refuses to let go until God blesses him. That's the same thing that goes on here. 
And, and this drives home the importance of, of being resolved in our faith. Do we believe that God is for us? Do we believe that he has our best interests in mind? Do we believe that he can restore us? Do we believe that he can heal? Do we believe that he will forgive sins? Do we believe that he can straighten out the direction of our lives? Do we believe that in following him, he will do something with our lives we can't do for ourselves? I hope that's the case. And if that's the case and we believe those things are true, hold on to that with resolve. And have faith, not just for yourself, but for the people around you. That when you pray for those who you love, when you pray for those who are around you who are suffering, that God will work in those situations. Hold on to that resolve. Let your faith bless your friends and your family. Carry them to Jesus in the same way that these men carried this paralytic. And trust that God will work in those situations. And then thirdly, we see... Finally, that it shows the dangers of an unwillingness to hear and respond to what Jesus is doing. See, sometimes in our our day and age, we, we get caught up in disbelief. We claim that we believe, we claim that we follow, but then we we get so earthly minded that we we fail to consider that God might be working and doing incredible things in people's lives and people will come and tell us what God is doing and our initial response to that is to be skeptical of those things. Okay, granted, we don't believe everything everybody says all the time because sometimes people lie, but you know what? God is at work. God is doing something in this world, in this church, in this community, in these people. So let's be people who are looking for him to work, who are looking for the evidence of his work, as opposed to people who are simply doubting everything under the sun. When I was in high school, in our art class, we had a corner of the class with the grumblers and the complainers, and my art teacher always called that the cockroach corner. So (laughs) you had... You had students all spread out, and some of us were happy-go-lucky, and then there was this corner where the kids just sat back there, and everything was wrong, and everything was terrible, and they complained, and she called them the cockroach corner. And I want to tell you, Christianity has a cockroach corner as well, right? And it's the place where all those people who are resistant to believing that God can work, although they claim he does, but their lives don't, don't seem to reflect that. And as a result, they're joyless. Guys, Have you ever seen Christians who are absolutely joyless? My gosh, that is a plague to see the people of God who are supposed to have their lives and their hearts changed, sitting here living with such earthly minded, or or maybe it's not even that they're earthly minded, it's just they get so focused in on certain things and they get so depressed about it because... uh, I'm going to ban cell phones from the sanctuary. (laughs) Also, my voice is changing. I'm kidding. The point is, don't, let's not get in that corner, right? Let's not be like these guys who, when, when they're presented with this, are resistant to it or try to rationalize it away. But instead, let's say, you know what? Like God may be moving in this situation. Let's pray for discernment. But let's, let's trust and believe that God is going to do incredible things. When Jesus divides our understanding and he messes up our categories, it's, it's up to us to then expand those categories and understanding and grow, not buckle down and refuse to believe that he's working, but rather hold out hope and faith that he is and he will work and give credit and glory to God where credit is due. This morning, I want to say, if you get nothing else from this series, get this and protect yourself from falling into the failure of the scribes and the Pharisees. Expect Jesus to work. Like, hold on with resolve to that hope that he is going to work in our lives. Have expectation, whether it's miraculously overt or, or just simply providential. He's present and he's able, so let's hold on to the belief that he can work and live in expectation that when we pray, our prayers will be answered and that God will work on our behalf and that our lives will be better as a result of following him and that we will develop a closeness to him and that life will be different because we follow after him. That's what happened with the paralytic man, right? Life was different because of his interaction with Jesus. Let's hold to that expectation. Amen?
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, we thank you so much that you have given us, that you have given us the truth that that you are one who forgives and you are one who heals and that you are one who advocates for those who are, are dealing with infirmities. And Lord, whether those infirmities are physical or spiritual, we know that we can bring all of those things to you. And Lord, while we know that you might not always choose to forgive or choose to heal us of the physical infirmities, Lord, we know that when it comes to the spiritual, you are always faithful and you are always true. And that Lord, if we will confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. And Lord, that, that greatest malady, that greatest infirmity that, that affects us, which is, is our sin, Lord, you are primed and ready to always forgive and heal us of those sins. Lord God, we, we thank you so much for that truth. We thank you so much that we can come to you with an expectation that you are going to forgive and that you are going to, to heal what needs to be healed in us. Lord God, let us always live in that expectation because we know that you, you love us and that you are for us. Lord, we know that, that you have a plan for our lives and we can depend on that and we can trust you in that. So Lord God, just work in our hearts, work in our lives so that we live every day in trust and in expectation. Jesus, we love you. We are resolved to follow you in faith. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.
be encouraged this morning. We have an advocate. Be encouraged this morning. We have a healer and a savior. Be encouraged this morning. We have one who forgives us of our sins and who takes care of that deepest malady of the soul and who loves us and who is for us. Amen. Amen. We're going to end our service in the way that we normally do, which is to take our offering. If the Lord has placed it on your heart to contribute to the ministries of the church and what God is doing here on either side of the door, you will see uh, receptacles. You can drop the offerings in there. I want to encourage you as we close up this morning to sign up. Family camp is over on this side. Uh, the signups for, for VBS are here. Blue one is VBS, white one is Family Camp. Sign up before you leave this morning. And uh, we have in about 15 minutes, about 10 minutes, something 15, I don't know, something like that. We'll have our, our congregational meeting. Please, if you are a member of the church, stick around. Uh, it's an important meeting this morning. And uh, I will be at the door and we'll greet you. And uh, Hopefully, I will see you guys here in a few minutes, and if not, I will see you next week. The Lord bless you this week. Um, I will meet you at the door.